morning, ladies. <laughs> Welcome to Women's Bible Study. <laughs> so. Good Lord, it's good to be here in your house, Lord, and we pray that you just have your way in each one of our hearts, Lord. Pray that you use our time in worship and the study, Lord, uh, for your honor and for your glory in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Greater is the one who's in us. Greater is the one who calls our name. He will never fail. Stronger is the one within us. Stronger is the one who fights for us. I'm away. 
Lord, 
It's all on our behalf, Lord. We pray that you would bless this time, uh, this Bible study, Lord. I pray that you'd use my wife Nancy in a powerful way to teach your word, and Lord, that you'd be high and lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. That felt like the longest walk ever. <laughs> Thank you, person. I mean, Dan. That's why I call him this person. That's my nickname for him. No, it's so romantic, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, welcome, everybody. How are you guys all doing today? Good, good, good. I know. What happened to this table right here? Who is this table? Oh, you moved? Oh, Emily's sick today? Okay. Okay, cool. Well, let's open with a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are the name, the great name of Jesus is the one that should be lifted up. And Lord, thank you that you are a redeemer, you are a healer, you're almighty God, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, you're with us through every situation in our life. And Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you as we look into it, Lord, that once again we're reminded that it's the key to everything is in our relationship with you, is knowing your word knowing you through your word. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would just bless this time. Thank you for all these ladies that have made a sacrifice to come here this morning and spend time with you, to hear about you, to fellowship with their sisters, and to just grow. And we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I couldn't find a good joke that was appropriate. There's some really bad Christian jokes out there, let me just tell you. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Matthew 22. And as we continue to look today at the three parables that Jesus spoke to the chief priests and Pharisees who opposed him in the temple. It was just a few days before he was nailed to a cross. In a sense, this last parable is the most remarkable of all of them. Matthew's gospel was written to the Jewish people to prove to them that Jesus is the long-awaited king that God had promised. So let's read Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and fatted calf are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding." And they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding." So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on wedding garments. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is Wednesday of the last week of Jesus' life and ministry. Friday, he will be crucified. Sunday, he will be raised from the dead. So here we are at Wednesday. For three years, he has been preaching and teaching the gospel of the kingdom. He has been proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He has been offering himself and his kingdom to the people of Israel, his own people. 
his own people, the very called people of God. And now three years has ended, and the people have rejected him. The leaders have rejected him and are extremely hostile to him. And by Friday, we'll turn him over to the Romans for execution. On Saturday, he had arrived in Jerusalem. He had arrived for the festivities of the Passover. He stayed in Bethany, the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, dear friends. On Sunday, when he awoke to greet the day, he found a great multitude of people there for the Passover had come to Bethany to see him and hear him. And he spent Sunday with them. On Monday, he arose and riding the colt, the foal of the donkey, he entered the city of Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate to the hosannas and hallelujahs of the people who were hailing him, the Messiah and the Savior, believing and wanting to believe with all their hearts, hearts that he was the military Messiah they had hoped for, who would overthrow the Roman oppression and free them from that bondage. And so wishing with all their hearts that he would be that kind of military Messiah, they hailed him as that. That was Monday. And they awaited for him to attack the Romans, but he didn't. Monday night, he went back to Bethany, and in the morning, he came to Jerusalem, but he didn't attack the Romans. He went directly to the temple and attacked the Jewish religious system. On Tuesday, he cleansed the temple. He threw out all the money changers, as we saw last week, and all the sellers of the merchandise that had turned it from the house of prayer, God had intended it to be, to the den of robbers, and he cleansed it. That was Tuesday. This is Wednesday, and he's back in the temple. Now that it's cleansed, he has come back there to teach. He has come to preach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of salvation, and he has come to call all men to himself. And as he teaches, he collects a tremendous crowd. The people are listening, and the masses of people milled around the great courtyard of the Herodian temple. Jesus is the center of attention. The religious leaders are extremely threatened by this because he speaks of internal righteousness. He speaks of a true salvation that they know nothing about in their external self-righteous religion, and he is a threat to their system. And so in the process of moving about the temple and teaching, he's confronted by these religious leaders. And we saw last week in 20, chapter 21, 23, they stop him in his tracks and they say to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Or who gave you the authority to throw out all the businesses in this place? Who gave you the authority to end all the money changing? Who gave you the authority to speak about the rabbinical authority? Show us your credentials. And they were angry, and they were bitter, and they were hostile. And they're already planning his death, the Bible tells us. So he answers with these parables. And each parable we have looked at is a message of judgment. The parables at a simple understanding say this, you have rejected me. All of the Old Testament prophets spoke of me. All of the miracles that I have done validate my claim to be the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah. All of these words that I have said affirm that, but you have consistently and for three years repeatedly rejected me, and now God rejects you. That's the message of these parables. The tables have turned, and they are parables of judgment. Verse 2 says about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus always talked about the kingdom of heaven, didn't he? He never really got trapped into talking about anything else. I mean, they wanted him to get involved in a lot of other things, but he never said anything except things about the kingdom of heaven. So he says the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for a son. A wedding made by the king for his son would be the wedding of all weddings. What's important here is the Lord wants us to identify the greatest celebration that those people could ever comprehend in their culture. He is saying the kingdom of heaven is like the greatest celebration imaginable, thrown by the wealthiest person imaginable for the most honored person imaginable. He says in the Amplified, there was a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, I mean, this was going to be the blowout of all blowouts in that culture. He says in verse 3, he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. In those days, people didn't have watches, and they weren't as rigidly tied to time schedules as we are today. They didn't have the easiness of getting food ready 
that would go into preparing food for a long festival that usually lasted for up to seven days for lots of people. So pre preparation was difficult. Those that had been, had been invited probably prayed it around saying, I don't know if you know it, but I've been invited to the wedding feast for the son of the king. So they may have gloated about their invitation. Now when the food is just about ready, the king sends out servants to those invited saying, everything is ready, come. But unbelievably, they don't come. So what was the king's response? He's a nice king. He's a kind king. In verse 4, again, he sends out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Verse 5, But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. So verse 6, And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. So let's look at all this. They treated the invitation with indifference, and they walked away. One went to their farm and another to his business. They basically say, no, we are not coming to a great, grand, glorious, royal wedding. We're going to go to our farm and our business. Verse 6 says, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. This is outright hostility added to indifference, and both are rebellion against the king. The story is clear here. The king is God, the son is Jesus, and God is calling people to his son. He's calling people to his kingdom and to honor his son. The already invited guests are the Jews or Israel. You can look back in Genesis 12 where God called out of the loins of Abraham, the people of Israel, and said, I'm going to make out of your loins a great nation, a nation through whom the earth will be blessed, and anyone who blesses them will be blessed, and anyone who curses them will be blessed. He called out that special nation. They were the called. And who are the servants that go out to call the already invited or called ones? Preachers, like John the Baptist, like Jesus himself, like the apostles. So here we see the chosen ones. The kingdom of God is offered to them. And the king says, here's my son. Here's my kingdom. Come and honor my son. He sends out his preachers, and what do they do? They murdered them. They killed John the Baptist. They cut off his head. They killed Jesus. They crucified him. James was the first apostle to go, and he was beheaded as well. The rest of the apostles is a list of martyrs. They killed the preachers. The indifferent or uninterested people in this parable are the people who were preoccupied with their farm and their business. They were the secular people who were so preoccupied with stuff that they were more into the physical and the spiritual. They're more into earthly possessions than heavenly realities. And we all wonder, you think the Jews knew that he was talking about them? Do you think they got the message? If you go back to Matthew 21, 45, it says, Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his disciples, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Sure they knew. They couldn't escape it. Verse 7 says, But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. The king had been so gracious. He had sent out two groups of people to bring the invited guests because he wanted to show the generosity, the kindness, the forgiveness, the grace and mercy of the king. It was meant to demonstrate how gracious the king is. And how willing he is to call again and again and again, as Jesus did, as John did, as the apostles did. Calling again and again, over and over, day after day, month after month, year after year for the duration of the ministry. And I don't know about you, and I know we all have different testimonies, but I am so thankful that God in his love and patience kept after me. Most of you know Gary's my brother, and when Gary first became a Christian... He invited me and my older brother, Mike, to North Park Calvary Chapel to hear Mike McIntosh. Sandy, his wife, is going to be our speaker for our retreat. I had not set foot in the Catholic Church that we grew up in for many years at this point, and I had never really heard the gospel that I could relate to or understand. But I, when I heard Mike that day, it was like all the pieces came together, and I went forward, bawling my eyes out. It was a very emotional time for me. 
But guess what? I didn't go back for two more years. I went back to my worldly lifestyle and I got stuck there. I knew what I heard was real, but could just not give up my friends and the way I was living. But you know what? God never let me go. He just kept nagging me and nagging me to the point that I had to go forward again at a Daryl Mansfield concert in Kennedy Park. <laughs> Two years later, Gary was preaching, Dan was playing. I thought Dan was weird at that time, but, but this time it wasn't, it was for real. And God gave me the strength to walk away from my lifestyle, my boyfriend at the time, and partying and all of it and never look back. And I praise God that he sought me when I was such a sinner because I was like that seed that fell among the thorns and got choked out, mentioned in Luke 8, 14. Back to the parable. The king's patience had a limit. His patience had an end. And when they killed the servants, he responds in anger, and it is justified, for unrighteousness has slain righteousness. Any man who understands good and what is right would react as he reacted. So the murderers were destroyed, and the order was given for the burning of their cities. In verse 8, he says to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out on the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Why weren't they worthy? Not because they weren't worthy enough or good enough, because they wouldn't accept the invitation. You see, when he goes back to call another group in verse 10, he calls those that are bad and good, it says. Aren't we thankful? <laughs> So he isn't looking around to find the most noble, the most moral, or the most self-righteous people in the world. Worthiness is tied to saying yes to the invitation. Verses 9 and 10, we see everything is ready and there's nobody to come, so something new has happened. It's been taken away from the nation that rejected his invitation, and now it's going to be given to a new people. It says go everywhere and get everybody that'll come. Go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. That's what Paul's book says. That's what Paul says in the book of Romans when he says, the fall of Israel is the rising of many. Through their fall, we have come to salvation, and aren't you glad? We have replaced them in this particular time, and God yet has something for Israel. They're going to come back into his favor at some point. They're going to come back to his redemptive plan, and that's why they are regathering in the nation today. When we went to Israel about seven years ago with this church, um, we went back to the center. We went to the center where a lot of the Jewish people are coming back to Israel, and they come there to get, you know, information on how to move back into the culture. To see our church give them a big fat donation from Christians was amazing. They were blown away. As several of them sat there and told their stories of why they had come back to Israel, you knew it was supernatural. It was a God thing. Because even they don't even yet understand why they want to come back. But they're being drawn. But in the meantime, he has stretched out his arm and he has sent the message to everywhere and everyone. As many as you find, invite them all to come. And isn't that the heart of the gospel message? Their fall became our rising. God will not be frustrated. The celebration will go on. Verse 11, but when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. This is a pretty tacky person. It's a seedy character. You go to a wedding at a king's place, you got to do what's right. Lots of commentaries said things like, well, maybe he didn't have time to go home. Or whether the king provided a garment and he missed out. There's a big debate. But he was easy to spot. You have a whole group of people all in their best, and there's a guy in rags. The king saw him and asked him in verse 12, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. You think if he had a good excuse, he would have given one at that time. Oh, my, my wife took my clothes to the cleaners and, I, and they weren't back yet. Or this is all I have. But he had no excuse. I mean, he came in there saying, I'm just going to be myself, see? I mean, I'm not going to do anything different than I normally do. I'm just going to come to the party just like I am. Very proud, very insulting, very thoughtless. Verse 13, so the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness there will be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
You may ask, why did they do that? Because if they didn't do that, he probably just would have come back. So they tie him up so he can't, and they put him in utter darkness out in the dark streets. He's going to have a great regret, and he will groan and weep and gnash his teeth. And what is all this saying? It's saying that there are going to be people who try to crash the kingdom. And they come, and they hang around, and they join the church, and they get involved, and they're a part. Who are these people? They're sort of like the people in Matthew 7 who say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Lord, Lord, you, we've preached. And he says, out, I never knew you. Who are you? These are the kingdom crashers. These are the tares among the wheat. They are not properly garmented. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. The king looked at this man and he saw no righteousness. That is no right living, no right thinking, no right speaking. He saw no godliness. He said, you don't belong here. You don't crash the kingdom on your own terms. And the whole thing closes with verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. The call goes out to many, but only a few are chosen. It's an eternal call. It's a true call to salvation. The gospel invitation is sent out to everywhere. Some are indifferent. Some are hostile. Some try to crash the kingdom on their terms, but few are chosen. With the word chosen, we're introduced to the sovereignty of God. Yes, there is the will of man in receiving the invitation. Yes, there is the will of man in rejoicing, rejecting the, the invitation. But the perfect balance to that God is to that is that God is sovereign. And those who come, choose to come, the Bible says, because they are chosen by him. That's a mystery that we'll never fathom, fathom, but we believe it. May we know that the Jew or Gentile can come, any at all, on God's terms, and that is faith in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moving on, we need we read verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and an inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. These passages just show us how dense the Pharisees were. They've been embarrassed countless times, and they're back for more punishment. Whether it was because of inexperience or extreme stubbornness, the Pharisees would have to learn their lesson once again. But this time, they sent their disciples and the Herodians to do the dirty work. So who were these Herodians mentioned in verse 16? Not a lot is known about this group. Many believe, as in the name, they were supporters of Herod, obviously. They were probably a sect of Jews, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees. But the gospel, record, rec records, the gospel record mentions them much less frequently. But every time they are mentioned, they are set in opposition to Jesus' work. Their interests may have been more political than spiritual. In an effort to entangle him in his words, as it says in verse 15, the disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians approach Christ with inquiry about taxes. They start off with flattery in verse 16, hoping to conceal their true intentions. But they ask him in verse 17, Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What is their angle there? They probably thought they could catch Jesus no matter which answer he gave. If he told the people to pay their taxes, he would lose popularity with the people, and the Pharisees could go about proclaiming Jesus to be a Roman supporter, which is obviously not what the people were looking for in a Messiah. If he told the people they didn't have to pay their taxes, Jesus' enemies could report him to the Roman authorities and have him arrested. Genius, or so they thought. But Jesus says in 18 through 22, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you t test me, you hypocrites? 
show me the tax money. Jesus was not deceived by their flattery. He immediately knew who they were and why they came. And so he calls them hypocrites. He asked to see the coin for showing tribute. They gave it to him. This is likely the same coin that is referred to in Matthew 20, verses 116, during the parable of the laborers that we saw a few weeks ago in the vineyard that we read. The man pictured is Imperial Tiberius, who reigned from 1480 to 37 AD. So he asked them, whose likeness was on the coin? And they respond, Caesar's. Jesus calmly told them to give Caesar what belonged to him and give God what belongs to him. Now, the Romans had a lot of taxes. There were certain things that the Jews had to give to the temple. And this didn't sit well with the Jewish people. I mean, it didn't sit with them at all. This Roman taxation system, they felt was an abuse because they saw themselves as people of God. When Rome moves in and imposes on them so many taxes, they have the feeling that they're giving what belongs to God to Rome. And they didn't like that. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do, do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a coat for advice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the king. Fulfilling our appointed obligations to the government as good citizens is a matter of being a good witness to our Lord before the world. To say nothing of it is a matter of obedience to our Lord Jesus himself. And that's hard to do today, isn't it? Our government's crazy. We are the first citizens of our Father's kingdom, but because we are citizens of an eternal kingdom first, we are obligated to be a good and faithful citizen of the temporal kingdom in which he has placed us. The second obligation, it seems to me, is what really brought the conviction down on those who were trapped, seeking to trap him with their question. Verse 22, when they heard these things, they marveled and left him and went their way. Luke 20, verse 26 tells us, they could not catch him in his words in the, in the presence of the people. If the Herodians had understood, they would have given to God what first belonged to God. They would not only render to Caesar what was Caesar's, but they would have also bowed down before the Lord Jesus and pledged their allegiance to him. But they were too blinded by their pride to be able to do that. Next we read in verses 20 through 33. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up an offspring for his brother. Now there, with, there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seven. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they had not, for they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they marry, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Another challenge, this one from the Sadducees. And as we discussed in chapter 3, and as Matthew clarifies here, the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. The question they bring to Jesus is probably one they believe is very tricky. They seem to be setting Moses' law against the resurrection, suggesting if one is true, the other can't be true. To understand the question it is important. We know all the Old Testament laws. And according to the Old Testament law, when a man married, a ma married man died without a son, the widow was not to marry again outside the family. Instead, the brother of the man who died was required to marry his dead brother's widow and have children with her. And the first son of their union was considered the son of, a, of the dear brother. You can read all about it in Deuteronomy 5, verses 5 through 10. The Sadducees exaggerated question asked, what if this happened six times in a family with seven brothers? On earth, she would have been married seven, to seven different men. So who will be her husband when she and her seven husbands are resurrected from the dead? 
I'm sure those brothers were kind of scared. I'm not going to lie. She kept kicking people off. The answer, Jesus obviously doesn't believe. This was a great dilemma. Their confusion about the issue is due to their fundamental misunderstanding of the marriage relationship in eternity and their failure to look closely at the scriptures. In two short statements, Jesus shreds the false dilemma and uses his Moses' own record of God's word in Exodus 3.6 to show them how foolish their view on the resurrection is. The question about the woman's true husband following the resurrection does not even matter because in eternity, marriage doesn't exist in the same sense we know it today. The resurrected will be like angels who are neither married nor given in marriage. Regarding the resurrection, in verse 32, he was not the God of a bunch of long dead people who existed only in the past tense. He was the present tense God of some people who were very long gone from the earth, but very much still alive. So the Sadducees' question was mute. When the crowd heard Jesus teaching, they were astounded. And Jesus, once again, calms it all down with the truth and clarifies the law. Heading into the end here, let's read verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So after the Pharisees hear of the embarrassment of the Sadducees, they decide it's their turn to try again. So they send a lawyer to ask Jesus another question. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? It's a bit harder to distinguish the angle the Pharisees are taking with this question. Maybe they thought they'd have a better chance of tripping him up if their question, question was broader rather than the specific question about taxes. But Jesus' answer is perfect. He says, if we love God, keeping his commandments, one will come naturally, and so will loving others. If our heart is in the right place, our lives will fall in line after that. God's commands are not burdensome for those who know he seeks our best. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome in 1 John 5, 3. And here's what you need to remember. You cannot have a Christian mind without reading the word because you cannot be profoundly changed by that which you do not know. Does that make sense? If you are filled with God's word, your life can then be informed and directed by God. Your relationships, your parenting, your career, your ethical decisions, your interior moral life, moral life, the way to a Christian mind is through God's word. If you want to love the Lord your God with all your mind, you can't put that book on a shelf and neglect it. There are four things that I want us to think about today as we leave. First of all, I believe that the Bible alone is the answer to all of our questions. And that we only need to ask repeatedly and humbly in order to receive the answer. Only if we venture into the words of the Bible as though in them our God we're speaking to us, who loves us and does not, will not leave us, only then shall we learn to rejoice in the Bible. If we say we love God, ultimately somewhere in the process we will learn to love his book, right? You can't read this book like any other book. You have to read it like a love letter from God. And when you do that, you begin to love God with all your mind. So number one, we feed on God's word. Number two, if you love God with all your mind, then you will find God's wisdom. Proverbs 13, 3.13 says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Proverbs 8.11 says, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. Proverbs 16.16 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding to be chosen rather than silver? Solomon, de Solomon describes wisdom this way. He says, length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. 
She is the tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. You want peace? Get to know his word. Get to know him through it. Somebody said, I read this, wisdom is knowledge using its head. Wisdom is doing the right thing without a precedent or a reason. Wisdom is the ability to take the word of God and apply it to the situations in life that face you. How many of us know if we've ever needed wisdom, we need it today? I mean, every day. Aren't we all faced with things we've never been faced with before? But today it seems like more than ever that's true. And we have to ask God for wisdom. The ability to apply the word of God says what we know about the word of God so that to, to be able to apply it to that particular situation. I talked to someone last night, and today more than ever, there's kind of a phenomenon going around. It's called global anxiety. Because this world is crazy. I think we all, no matter who we are, how strong we are in the Lord, we have this feeling inside of us like we just don't know what's going to happen. And it's kind of scary. And you have to take the word of God and you have to apply it and you have to do self-talk and you have to tell yourself, this is what's true. That's not true. In a willing mind, wisdom enables you to hear God's, with God's ears and see with God's eyes. And here's something I read. Wisdom is an inspired depth perception into people and situations. It's a vertical thrust of the mind of God into our minds, making discernment possible on the horizontal level of human affairs. And don't we all want that? We want discernment. We want to know what to follow. In these end days, it says there's going to be churches go crazy. There's going to be people that we love go crazy. They're not going to follow. We want to have wisdom. We want to have discernment. And with wisdom, we can penetrate the mysteries of God. We can sense his nature, his plan, and his purpose. And if we long to know God's best plan for our lives, wisdom is the gift we need. So we love God with our minds when we find God's wisdom. So thirdly, we feed on God's word. We find God's wisdom. And thirdly, we follow God's will. How do I love the Lord God with all my mind? I follow his will. I do what he tells me to do. Romans 2, 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now watch this. It says, That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you know that God's will is perfect and his individual will for you is perfect? When we seek and follow God's will for our lives, we are loving him with all of our mind and our heart and our soul. So we love the Lord our God with all our minds when we feed on his word, when we find his wisdom, when we follow his will. And finally, when we fight his war. War? What war? Well, if we look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, through, through it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, in God, pulling for, in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is a mission statement here, you guys. Everything that exalts itself against God must be thrown down. And every thought must be brought into the captivity of Christ. Paul wants us to know that the greatest battle in the Christian life are fought between our ears and our mind. And isn't that true? And I think that what he's saying here when he talks about casting down arguments is kind of a reflection of what we read in 1 Peter 3, 15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. As we've all probably experienced, we're living in an age where people are asking more questions about Christianity that they've never asked. And why? Because they're looking for hope. That global anxiety I talked about, those worldly people have it too. They just don't know what to turn to. So they're looking at us. At the very hour that Jesus spoke the words of the greatest commandment, Jerusalem was filled with people who practiced religious rituals, but without love for God and his son. So we need to know the word and be ready to share it with others. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God is the key to a proper relationship with God. Loving man is the key to a proper relationship with our fellow man. And how can this be accomplished? How can we learn to love other human beings properly? By observing God's love for us. 
we can understand what love is. That's how God wants us to love other people. God's love reflected off of us can be shown to our neighbors. If our hearts are filled with genuine love for others, even our enemies, we will not have a problem applying the rest of God's command in regards to how we treat those around us. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12 through 16, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The Bible says there is a narrow road and a wide road, and those who are on the narrow road are the ones who are going to heaven. The wide road, the Bible says, many walk on there, but they're headed toward destruction. Many of the people in these parables <clears throat> were headed the wrong way, and Jesus wants them to know the truth. I just say, let us have so much love for others that we learn the truth in his word so well that we can give them the answer and the truth from the word, which is the guidebook for life. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you today. We just thank you that um, you are truth. Lord, we thank you that you give us instruction through your word. I pray, Lord, if any of us are struggling with loving somebody in our life, God, that you just help us to just throw down those, those things that would get in our way and just follow your word and love people. Lord, I, hope, I pray that each one of us would just know how blessed we are that we get to be in a relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of this world, and that you have so much good for us, Lord. I pray if anybody in here is, is struggling with anxiety, that they would just take the word of God and they'd apply it and they'd memorize it and they'd put it in their heart in a place where they can call upon, where we can do that self-talk that reminds us of who you are. And we just thank you that you're so intimate with each and every one of us. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.